Welcome everybody to my, this introductory lecture on physiologically based pharmacokinetic modeling. And I will try uh, in the, during this presentation to give you an overview of PVPK and uh, also how we can use modeling for simulation of relevant clinical scenarios and opportunities and limitations related to this modeling. Um, technique. So I'm Marco Siccardi, a reader at the Department of Pharmacology and Therapeutics uh, at the University of Liverpool. And um, if you have any questions related to PBPK or modeling and related modeling applications, you're more than welcome to uh, send me an email um, and I can provide obviously additional material. So my email is siccardi at liverpool.ac.uk. What is physiologically based pharmacokinetic modeling in general terms? So PDPK modeling is a flexible computational framework in which we can integrate different type of data, preclinical, in vitro, um, and predict, simulate pharmacokinetics variability um, between and within patients and, and try to better rationalize um, the role of um, PK in various clinical um, scenarios. So we can use PVPK to provide a, a, a detailed understanding of a depending mechanism um, of pharmacokinetics, simulate relevant scenarios and understand the relationship between exposure and efficacy and exposure and uh, potential side effects. So if we have a broader over, um, overview of the tools that we have to actually investigate pharmacokinetics, we can obviously start in the lab with isolated pro uh, proteins, cells, uh, working animals, and uh, at the same time um, investigate the relevance of PK in volunteers and patients. Um, but obviously we need Whatever method and approach we are going to use, there's going to be a compromise between our understanding of mechanism, which is obviously is going to be higher if we work with isolated proteins, and the relevance of PK if we're going to run a clinical studies. So what PPK modeling does in a way is allowing us to relate mechanism with relevance of pharmacokinetics through a mechanistic understanding of drug distribution. Uh, and therefore provide um, an informed uh, base um, description of PK. So we start PBPK um, modeling through normally experimental in vitro assays that characterize some of the key processes regulating PK. So it can be phase one, phase two enzymes for metabolism, for example. And then we can integrate some of this knowledge, for example, phase one, phase two enzymes and passive permeability to predict intestinal permeability, um, uh, metabolic activity. These two elements together define absorption. Renal clearance and metabolic activity are the main uh, processes defining clearance. And uh, if we have an understanding of plasma to tissue ratio, we can predict volume of distribution. So you can see that we have the three key blocks to predict PK, absorption by availability, clearance and volume of distribution. And therefore then we can put clearance and volume of distribution together to predict half life, uh, as well as absorption and clearance to predict by availability. This is the core of the physiologically based pharmacokinetic modeling. So a mechanistic description of drug distribution based on differential equations that describe movement of drugs uh, between tissues, as well as the processes that can mediate oral absorption and metabolism. And so we can take the core of the, uh, of the models and then uh, predict by availability, volume of distribution and clearance. If we have information related to concentration dependent effect, PKPD, we can then simulate relevant scenarios such as PK in special population, drug drug interaction, pharmacogenetics, and even the design of novel formulation. PVPK is based essentially on uh, three 
blocks, let's say. Um, properties related to drug and formulation, factors related to the organism and uh, individual uh, or population of patients that we are interested to, to simulate pharmacokinetic in, and all the settings related to uh, route of administration, uh, dosing intervals, um, and in more general terms, the type of simulated clinical studies um, that we are interested to um, predict. All of these elements are embedded in a computer-based environment, computational fr framework that will have a certain structure as well as uh, assumptions for the simulation of pharmacokinetic. So focusing on formulation and drug properties, obviously we will need to take into account factors such as lipophilicity, solubility, molecular weight, stability in biological fluids of, of drugs, as well as all the uh, biological processes, the interaction of the drug with the um, plasma proteins, as well as tissue proteins, tissue to plasma ratio, permeability across membranes, activity of transporters and metabolic enzymes. Organism properties are related to all the physiological and anatomical factors that can describe the characteristics of individuals. So organ volumes, blood flow, composition of tissues and all the physiological informations. And obviously all of these can vary between the uh, type of populations of patients that we would like to include in our simulation. As I was saying, the setting of the studies would be uh, related to the route of administration, dosing strategy, number of subjects, and, and, and uh, population of patients. So here I just include some example of the properties and, and numerical um, elements that we will include in our simulations. Um, physical chemical properties, molecular weight, log P as you can see here, polar surface area can be relevant for certain equations, permeability across membrane, and then metabolic information for uh, the three different drugs for this specific example. In terms of organ properties, there is a broad variety of data set and databases in which we can actually um, describe the relationship between organ volume and specific physiological anthropometric uh, variables across multiple type of uh, population of patients. This is a classical example of a paper where height, for example, has been related with uh, organ size and volume. And then instead, in, in terms of study simulation, as I was saying, route of administration, specific characteristics of the population of interest in terms, for example, of age or gender or, or potential comorbidities. Population viability can be simulated considering, obviously, age, for example, and other characteristics such as gender and specific conditions that can be present in subpopulation of patients. How can we do that? Considering a network of equations that put together anthropometric, anatomical and physiological factors. So we can start from weight, height and body surface area and then from there together with gender, age and ethnicity uh, define uh, key physiological and anatomical factors, percentage of body fat, cardiac output, size of organs, and so on and so forth. So this approach will allow us to have the opportunity to simulate a range of ages from neonates to elderly, as well as integrating specific patient characteristics, pregnancy, or the comorbidities, or uh, the effect of potential environmental factors on uh, specific um, uh, variables. The model development and application um, is divided in different steps from collection and understanding of uh, in vitro DMPK data, integration of these data in the mathematical framework, testing the models against preliminary data, qualifying the model um, uh, fully um, against available uh, clinical data and then um, 
um, running predictions of unknown scenarios and potentially integrating models in uh, specific clinical applications. PVPK models can find application on a variety of different areas, let's say. So I just decided to uh, list a few examples of potential applications. For, so from the identification of patient characteristics and, uh, and ADMI processes influencing efficacy and toxicity, this refers to the integration of the description of the different um, processes defining PK. So often these are seen in isolation if we're only applying exper experimental in vitro approaches and PBPK allow us, um, supports the integration of the information in a, in a flexible environment. And then this knowledge can actually help us simulate relevant clinical scenarios optimization strategies in population of patients is this obviously an exciting prospect uh, because um, clinical studies can be simulated and rationalized in, uh, in, in when there are ethical and logistical barriers for specific subgroup of patients for example and PVPK can also uh, be utilized to rationalize development of novel formulation, formulation advanced materials to uh, improve drug delivery. So different route of administration, as well as different strategy to sustain, for example, prolonged release of drugs from implants or different type of tablets can all be simulated in this environment, having a clear effect and creating lots of opportunities to streamline the development of novel therapy and um, uh, simplify the regulatory process uh, reducing use of animals for example or simplifying the design of clinical trials moving forward one of the most important application of physiologically based pharmacokinetic modeling is the prediction of drug, -drug interaction so we can predict magnitude of drug, drug interaction starting from a mechanistic description of drug distribution and then we can integrate key DMPK data into our mechanistic uh, model to then as we were saying previously derive key pharmacokinetic uh, variables uh, volume of distribution bioavailability and clearance and then if we have a description of the inhibitory potential or induction potential of concomitant drug on the, and the on the key processes we can then derive and predict the drug magnitude evaluating risk of toxicity and loss of efficacy so you can imagine that uh, the physiological framework can give us quantitative prediction of uh, the drug interaction magnitude so let's have a look some examples in multiple cases, drug-drug interaction are not mediated by only a single mechanism, but there are multiple mechanisms that actually underpin drug-drug interaction. In this case, favirenz is an inducer of cytochrome P453A4, but at the same time, an inhibitor of 2C8. Therefore, in some cases, for drugs that are both metabolized by the two cytochrome P450, predicting this type of drug-drug interaction can be complex. So what um, we've done is to we've qualified the model against characterized PK of key, va of key drugs that are both metabolized by 3A4 and or uh, 2C8. And then we predicted some clinical cases in, in, in which uh, 3A4 and 2C8 are um, involved in a potential drug-drug interaction. As, and for these specific cases, uh, such as repaglinid, for example, or Montelukas, we then suggested potential dose adjustment um, if efavirenz was uh, concomitantly administered to patients. The great majority of drugs are given orally, obviously, but the route of administration can also be very important in the definition of the drug drug interaction. So there is a, an increasing number of drugs that um, are uh, going to be uh, potentially formulated, such as long acting formulation uh, in, in tromuscular injection, for example, or subcutaneous implant. So in this case, we have so at oral administration, as you surely know, we have two main um, processes that can 
uh, define a drug drug interaction, an effect on first pass metabolism as well as systemic clearance. But if a drug is administered um, in a muscle or subcutaneously, obviously the effect of the drug drug interaction is going to be only on a systemic clearance and not on the first pass metabolism. So the magnitude of the drug drug interaction is going to be different. And another factor that we have to take into account that often we are in the case of flip flop kinetics in which the rate of absorption is much slower compared to an oral administration if we are looking at intramuscular administration or sustained release um, formulations. Therefore, some of the key parameters that, and processes that define the drug interaction are completely different based on the route of administration and formulations that we are using in patients. So we have certain drugs for which we have oral formulation as well as long-acting formulation, intramuscular formulation available for patients. Um, so we can qualify the model for the oral formulation of all these given drugs, cabotegravir, for example, and we have um, the model performing quite well against what we know about the drug drug interaction with rifampicin, for example, for oral administration. But running clinical studies for long acting formulations that are given once a month once every two months is extremely challenging because they obviously the time frame is much longer than our oral formulation. So physiologically based pharmacokinetic modeling can be used as a predictive tool to uh, provide um, predictions for um, long acting formulation. In this case, um, we have predicted that the magnitude of the drug drug interaction will be actually lower for the long-acting formulation and there would only be an effect on absolute concentration and not half-life as has been uh, described for the old formulations. And then we can then simulate virtual clinical trials uh, through which we are testing a variety of different combination of doses for um, long-acting formulation in order to understand which dosing patterns are more at risk of uh, let's say dangerous drug drug interaction in, in, if we're considering uh, loss of efficacy, obviously. Interestingly, the regulators have actually evaluated the quality of the prediction that are available um, through physiologically based pharmacokinetic modeling for drug drug interaction involving en enzyme modulation for this specific paper. And it's pretty interesting that um, for the variety, for a broad variety of drug drug interaction, the quality of the prediction is pretty high. So, um, drug drug interaction here and then published by a PPPK model have been divided in four groups, uh, where they've been substrate inhibited or induced respectively, and the same thing for en enzyme modulators, as you can see in the bottom left corner. And across the four groups, um, more than 50%, on average, more than 50% uh, of the predicted AUC were actually within a predefined threshold of 1.25 fold of observed value. And if we're actually using a slightly more generous kind of um, interval for evaluating the quality of the prediction, uh, around 90% of the prediction were within the two-fold um, the two-fold range. So pretty um, uh, high quality um, results for this type of prediction that can help uh, regulators and developers in rationalizing the risk related to the drug interaction for both substrate as well as enzyme modulators, obviously. But you know better than, than me that we are not treating average individuals, but um, every patient is unique. And in some cases, certain patients can be classified in specific subpopulation of, um, of patients. So we have obese patients, elderly patients, neonatal patients, and so on and so forth. So we can capture these um, subpopulation characteristics through mathematical equation and then embed this mathematical equation in the models, providing a, a stratified uh, approach for predictions as well. And there are multiple 
publications on that in, in which patients with renal impairment, elderly, pregnant women, and uh, neonatal patients have been described uh, in order to um, provide uh, um, a prediction of uh, PK. In this case, just a, a relatively simple example um, in which obviously um, we focus on pediatric and neonatal patients and as you know the physiology of uh, apart from the psychology of um, pediatric patients is very different than adults as you can see here for the uh, how they, they they see the change in weather and a classical example is the changes in expression of cytochrome P453A4 and 3A7 that obviously is extremely different in the first um, days uh, compared to later phases of, of life. So all of these can be captured in physiologically based pharmacokinetic modeling and uh, models can be used to then try to identify um, which are the most sustainable dosing regimens for specific uh, drugs, in this case HIV drugs that are extremely relevant for um, neonatal uh, patients. So the rationale here is to use PVPK models to identify which are the most suitable, uh, theoretically, most suitable uh, dosing regimens to then design um, rationally the clinical studies that, that can help um, supporting us access to these specific therapies for um, for neonatal patients obviously clinical trials in neonates are very difficult to conduct and the trial design can be de risk by those prediction based on modeling and in this case uh, we have identified that a uh, dose of five milligram um, per day is actually uh, potentially the, uh, the most uh, um, suitable for prophylaxing and treatment of HIV in neonates. And as I, as I mentioned before, obviously this is not just a um, academic exercise, let's say, uh, or something to support rationalizing clinical studies but regulators are increasingly recognizing the relevance of pbpk thinking let's say uh, during drug development um, because it's improved and support mechanistic understanding of processes mediating drug disposition and um, enabling, enabling better labeling around drug, drug interaction and special population Obviously, while we are discussing the application of these type of models, we can't forget that they have um, uh, major limitations, let's say. So I would say that um, there are different scenarios in which we can actually apply this type of model. So in the, in the ideal scenario, we have a high quality of available clinical data to qualify, validate the models, as well as a detailed understanding of mechanism underpinning absorption distribution metabolism and elimination and pharmacokinetic pharmacodynamic so if we are in this case the green square here obviously we have a reliable application of the modeling strategy but in many cases we are in, in, in an in sort of intermediate scenario in which we have either high um, quality of available uh, clinical data and low understanding so we can potentially um, integrate correction factors to then in a way fit um, our prediction to the observed data and in, in, in cases in which we have a good understanding of ADMI but very low quality preliminary data uh, in humans um, in some cases, we can actually then use preclinical models as a sort of as a way of comparing our the prediction of, of, of PK. Worst case scenario in which we have both low quality and low understanding, low quality of data and low quality understanding, and, and we are in the case of the garbage in, garbage out uh, scenario. Uh, which potentially you're already very familiar, but if the quality of the the data that we are inputting in our models independently from the um, sophistication and complexity and 
and, uh, and advanced mathematics that we're applying in the models, the predicted results are not going to be reliable. And this is particularly relevant because some of the uh, correction factors, constant equations that we're applying in the PPK model can actually, in a way, create a multiplying kind of effect in which apparently insignificant constant can have uh, a very relevant effect on suggested doses or in any way the quality of our, of our, of our prediction. Some of the elements that we have to keep in mind that we have a complex computational framework that um, uh, we are embedding in the models. There is always a, a, a broad variability in experimental approaches that are, are actually used to generate data as input. The in vitro in vivo extrapolation uh, can be complex and, and often we're dealing with unknown mechanisms that are actually underpinning the distribution. In some cases, um, for certain patients, there can be poorly characterized patient-specific factors uh, that we know little about. For example, expression of transporters for certain subcategory of patients um, thinking about cirrhosis, for example. And then in, in some cases, um, there can be an in, in a, inappropriate correction for experimental factors. Let's assume protein binding, for example, in, in media uh, compared to plasma tissues. So all of these has to be taken into account when we actually evaluate uh, the quality of potential predictions. So I, I, I would like to highlight that then often, instead of seeing the model development application as a linear process, we actually go through circular kind of interaction between the different stages in which there is a constant improvement uh, and an adaptation of uh, model stra modeling strategies in order to better um, describe uh, PK and PKPD. In, in a physiological and mechanistic uh, approach. The exciting aspect related to PVPK modeling is that there is a constant and dynamic interaction between experimental um, approaches, computational models, and clinical studies to support ADMI understanding and and for application around predicting the drug interaction, rationalizing complex clinical scenarios, and dosing for special population, to then hypothesize uh, identification of those adjustments, uh, rationalize the design of future clinical studies, and streamline the research and development process. So if you put all of these elements together, as it's clear that physiologically based pharmacokinetic modeling is not simply a pharmacometric tool that can find large application, but also um, is um, uh, an exciting um, let's say, language and way of interpreting PK uh, that can um, streamline how we're actually developing and optimizing therapies. And there is a multidisciplinary interplay around uh, PVPK modeling. So input from the clinical uh, community field, description of patient characteristics, identification of clinical ch uh, challenges and the design of clinical studies, as well as um, integrating modeling in uh, strategies to rationalize prescription. For example, the drug and formulation development field can be um, related to modeling through identification of drug, drug interaction prone candidates, how to streamline selection of drugs for development and how to inform the design of formulations. Obviously, basic pharmacology, um, molecular pharmacology is relevant, um, novel ADMI processes, how to optimize experiments, how to extrapolate in vitro, in vivo extrapolation, um, sorry, in vitro data to uh, in vivo um, predictions and how to integrate the use of preclinical models are all very relevant questions that can um, have an interface with modeling. And also from the modeling and programming 
environment, uh, there could be several interesting and motivating interaction. Um, integrating PPK with population-based modeling, how to inform machine learning algorithms that are emerging in a, in, in a variety of different applications, the interaction with quantitative system pharmacology, as well as uh, opportunity to transfer models across different platforms and compatibility uh, between applications. So I hope you have found the presentation interesting, and this is only a general overview of PBPK modeling and potential applications. If you are interested in additional reading materials and or articles, uh, please get in touch. Um, or if you have um, additional questions, uh, extremely happy uh, to support um, your further understanding of uh, PBPK. Thank you.